Um, my name is Donald Millock. I'm the chairman of the Roads and Transportation Society. I'm delighted to welcome, all, uh, welcome you all here tonight um, to what is effectively our annual general meeting. So um, just to kick off events, obviously the core focus of this is the, the presentation that Brendan has agreed to give us. So just uh, in terms of the proceedings for tonight, um, <coughs> we'll kick off with a lecture. At the very end, I'm just going to give the chairman's report. We'll have a small Q&A session afterwards after the lecture. And then I'll just read out the chairman's report for the for the year in terms of the progress that the society has has uh, implemented, and then we just need to do a little bit of housekeeping in terms of officers' roles and that kind of stuff. And um, we're more, uh, more than happy to try and welcome new members into the society as well. So um, just to kick on then, in, in uh, Brendan uh, Brendan O'Brien uh, uh, has a master's of science and a bachelor of science. He's the uh, head of technical services uh, in Dublin City Council Environment and Transportation Department. Uh, he's responsibility for traffic management throughout the city, uh, transportation forward planning, public lighting, noise and envi environmental monitoring, as well as responsibility for Dublin City Council with regards to the Lewis Cross City project and um, the DCC Lewis uh, LCC liaison office. Some of the initiatives that Brendan has uh, been, had responsibility for include the five axle HGV ban, something that's of particular interest to someone like myself working for the National Roads Authority and, and um, the, the toll roads that I, 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 I manage. Uh, the College Green bus gate, and uh, the rollout of the Canalway segregated cycle route, and the na uh, nationwide rollout of the real-time bus, train, tram, real-time information system, tracking uh, real-time in bus, tram, and rail arrivals at over 10,000 stops throughout Ireland. So it's a very impressive uh, repertoire that Brendan has there, and I think that that we can see then that that uh, promises to uh, uh, um, make its way into this uh, what, what I'm sure will be a very well-informed uh, uh, presentation. So. Let me just introduce Brendan. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, That's for the introduction. Um, I suppose what uh, what I was going to do this evening was just um, talk a little bit about uh, where we, where I suppose we are at at the moment um, with transportation in Dublin and some of the challenges that uh, uh, that are facing us. Um, and I suppose uh, you know when we think of the city. Um, this is the 1836 uh, map. Really, by the time we came to that, at, at that particular time, once the canals were finished, um, the city shape, Marion Square, Stevens Green, uh, Trinity College, you know, that was the shape of the city. And really, to be honest, um, the city centre, you know, hasn't really changed since then. There's been um, you know, some initiatives, we've built different bridges, we've changed structures, roads, we've done a few different things, but the basic city that we deal with is, is really the, um, the 18th, 19th century uh, city. So that obviously provides its own challenges, its own opportunities. Um, this is from our development plan. Uh, it looks at the key pedestrian routes, it looks at the, the main areas of interest. Um, so. You know, when, you're, when you think about, um, you know, connecting Marion Square, say, to Parnell Square, when you think about the Georgian Squares, when you think about the, the keys, when you think about the function tr throughout the city, um, this really is what, what defines it. So, and again, you can see the broad shape of the city is still the same. It's still the canal uh, network. So if we look back to, to some of the things that used to be in Dublin, so this is... Uh, this is O'Connell Street from, from the early 80s, and you know, I, I guess it was, it's not meant to be a criticism of anything back in the 80s, but I don't think anybody would want to park buses again in O'Connell Street in the median. Um, and when I was looking at this, you know, if you look very carefully, you can see a, one poor pedestrian is trying to get up the median uh, by the buses um, without much success. And again, you know, at that stage, we didn't have drop curbs, we didn't have, you know, any, any, uh, anything from, for mobility. We didn't really have much of an interest in the pedestrian realm. Uh, it, was, it was very much a, a different kind of city. So obviously, you know, O'Connell Street, that whole O'Connell Street plan, the whole uh, kind of development of an integrated area plan, uh, was one of the, the, the big key drivers and one of the key um, successes. But what's interesting about that is if you think of O'Connell Street back in the 80s and 90s and um, you know, the early 2000s, um, there was roughly about 1,400 vehicles an hour coming down, heading southbound. 
um, you know, in the, in the peak. And we managed to reduce it from four lanes to two lanes, and we managed to reduce the number of cars down by about two, to about 200, you know, along with a lot of buses. But the integrated area plan um, was a pretty ambitious one. I don't know whether any of you are anyway familiar with it. It came out in 98. And it set out a number of different visions. It set out the vision for the city, for, for O'Connell Street, to, to remove as much true traffic as possible, to widen the footpaths, to make a, a you know, pretty bold civic, civic uh, statement. But it actually had two further objectives, which um, didn't happen at the time for a number of reasons. But, this, but it's kind of interesting just to think about them now. The second objective of this uh, was to allow Lewis to be built in College Green. So we're finally getting around to, to that. Obviously, at the time in '98, uh, what was uh, what was being planned was the Lewis Line, which was linked. Um, so going through College Green at that stage, and the third item was uh, was a pretty interesting one as well. Um, the third item in that plan called for pedestrianisation of uh, College Green, and the proviso was when all the objectives or when all the strategies in the DTI report, the 1994 DTI report, had been uh, fulfilled. So it's interesting to look back at the detail report now and, and you know, which, which, you know, it's where things like the Port Tunnel came from, the Lewis, uh, the Lewis lines, where the QBCs came from, where the whole kind of concept of, of public realm uh, pedestrianisation and so on came from. So I guess as we, as we start heading into the next uh, kind of cycle of both development plans, um, and also the next big project, which obviously is the Lewis Cross City project, um, you know, we're now starting to move from where we are in 98 with that particular plan and several parts of that plan are now, if you like, starting to come into fruition. However, this is a different plan which I thought you might just like, um, depends on whether how, how well you are a true road en roads engineer or not. This was the 1971 Dublin City Corporation plan, which was for Okay, to orientate yourself, you've got the four courts, you've got uh, the civic offices over there. This is Thomas Street, so Thomas Street was, you know, the dual carriageway. I, actually, sorry, not a dual carriageway, it was a three-lane in each direction road, so a six-lane road. Um, and this is Kevin Street here with a very nice um, design of, of, uh, of an interchange. Um, and this is kind of what it looked like in context of the of the houses. So, you know, Smithfield is actually the brown area up there, except the road is where Smithfield is at the moment. And this was one particular thing that we're quite glad that didn't happen, uh, because this was a motorway bridge obscuring your view of the forecourts. So, you know, again, you know, sometimes in this job you're kind of conscious of following the line of a lot of different people. Um, and it's not so much that it's a criticism, that was the thinking of the day, it's just that as the city evolves, you know, in another 10 years' time, there'll be a different way of looking at things or a different way of doing things. However, you know, if we get on and look at some of the facts and figures of, say, our cordon count, and again, you know, the city is really divided by the cordon, it's really divided by the canals, and when we think of the city, of the city we, we very often perhaps fall into the, into the kind of... Uh, thinking of being within the canals, but in this case we are specifically looking at within the city centre because um, we're looking at what's, what's happening in the city centre and we're looking at how people get in and out of the city centre. And, you know, if we look at the, the figures from 2006 to 2014, the most obvious thing that if you look at the number of total person trips, you can see clearly the impact of the recession. We went from 207,000 people crossing the canal cordon in the morning peak down to 180. So quite a staggering drop. And also if you look at how rapidly it happened, you know, so 2006, 207, you know, 2007, 203, 199, 188, 181. So very, very rapid decline in the numbers crossing the canal. And if you look, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about recovery, there's a lot of talk about, the, um, you know, where we are, but we're not back up at the number of person trips, so we're still down. What you do have to take into account when you're looking at these figures is this is what's coming across the canal cordon in the morning peak. So we would have a re roughly about 40,000 trips generated internally within the canal cordon as well. So you're looking really at around 240,000 person trips in that 7 to 10 uh, time period. 
If you also look, um, you know, one of the things that happened was the, uh, the public transport suffered really, really badly at the time. You know, bus dropped 10,000 passengers in the morning peak. So that's 20,000, you know, there's 10,000 people who aren't coming in, 10,000 people who aren't coming back out. But the rail, the rail was quite phenomenal. It went from 35,500 down to 22. And I was at a briefing, I was at a thing yesterday in the Chamber of Commerce, the Minister for Transport put it very succinctly. He said, we invested in rail and then the passengers died away. So the rail service as a consequence died away. Um, so, you know, when you look at those kind of figures, it's, it's, it's quite clear that at one stage, the public transport in the city was doing, was bringing in 102,000 people. Now we're back down to 93,000. So there's that capacity that was put into the system and then, if you like, taken back out and this is your kind of person trips by mode. And, you know, one of the things about percentages and percentages of modes, I, I, I never really believe in them very much myself. I quote them a lot to people, but I don't actually really think they're a great figure. And uh, the simple reason is that, as you can see, for example, you know, as the number of persons dro drop, uh, what seemed to happen was that the number of cars, you know, rose up again. Uh, in actual fact, the number of cars pretty much stayed the same. What happened was the overall number of person trips um, decreased. And this was an interesting one as well, which was what happened to travel to work. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly clear when you look at those kind of figures and, and you bear in mind, you know, say, for example, that Dublin bus went from, 100 and, I think it was 145 million passengers a year down to 117 million. So that impact throughout the whole of the uh, Greater Dublin area. But this is an interesting one which showed that, um, you know, in 2006, people were leaving early, as, you know, anecdotally everybody knows that, but this is, you know, uh, confirming it. And then as the recession hit, people started to leave later and later. So what you had was that kind of, if you like, you know, where people were congestion and traffic became not really the great issue uh, anymore. Probably as evidenced by the fact we don't have a full house either today, so people are not as interested as they were back then. However, when we look at the cordon count, we, you know, some of some things pop out of that as well, and the most, you know, one of the things pops out is the number of buses. So we used to have 1,800 buses coming in in the peak. Uh, we're now down to 1,500. So you've had network direct, you have various other things. The buses might be used more efficiently or whatever, but the simple truth of the matter is there's 300 less coming in across in the morning peak. So that's a, that's, that's a key dent in the, in the bus fleet. And again, if you look at the Dublin bus fleet, the Dublin bus fleet went from, I think it was around 1,100 down to 900. Um, so, you know, it all, it all contributed. However, if you look at the car, the car stayed remarkably the same. This is what I'm saying about mode share and person trips. This is the actual number of vehicles, which gives you a much clearer indication of what was going on. So we had car stayed absolutely rigid, 58, 58, 58. 58, and then 2011 suddenly declined. And that decline continued on, and so it's, it's, it's down at its lowest level uh, in 2014. So there's about 5,500 vehicles, 5,500 cars take, taken off at that stage. Why exactly, um, why exactly this happened at that particular point in time is a, is a matter of some conjecture for us all. Um, some people reckon it was the completion of the M50, um, you know, which took a lot of cars out of the city centre. You could have also argued it was, it was things like the introduction of the bike scheme, you know, feeding through of the cycling, feeding through walking, whatever. But, you know, whichever way, once that happened, then the decline started quite, quite dramatically to, to happen. At the same time, you know, if you look now at walking and cycling, walking and cycling is almost 30,000 people. Um, and that's up quite, quite a bit from, from, from where it was. I mean, cycling and walking before this was about 21,000. So that's a, quite a considerable of a change of, of way of coming into the city. The other thing I suppose just to bear in mind is in terms of the number of vehicles, you know, the goods vehicles here, 2006, 2007, and then by 2008, down to 1,200. So goods vehicles are <clears throat> any commercial vehicles, but the big hit there was obviously the opening of the port tunnel and the uh, HGV ban. So one of the um, 
One of the things that people ask us, you know, is um, they're starting to get concerned about congestion going back to the previous levels. And, uh, you know, as volumes rise, you know, say, for example, the M50 is up something like 6% this year. So how is that going to affect the city? And one of the things that we're saying is that in actual fact, the city cannot go back to the level of, of uh, vehicles that it was before, um, mainly because of all these things that have happened since 2006. Um, this isn't the most comprehensive list. I'm sure I've left various different things out, Newlands interchanges and various other projects. But they, you know, to us in the city centre, they were probably the big, uh, the big ones. Um, and it's also interesting to look at them in terms of investment and uh, forward planning and so on. So by the time we came to 2006 with the Dublin Port Tunnel, you know, and bringing in the HGV ban and so on, that had been in gestation since the early. 80s really and then moving through but it was a big huge project that we had as a result of the port tunnel and the removal of the HGVs the, we put in the continuous bus lanes in the North Keys so you know that was the first time that there was a continuous bus lane in the North Keys. Um, 2008 we had the M50 we obviously had the College Green bus corridor and, and, and so on um, but as we go through then you start to see that the type of schemes that were coming in were changing you know we had the bike schemes we had some bus card or upgrades. We had um, real-time passenger with leap card, but really, you know, there's a kind of dearth of, of major projects in, in that list. Um, and then you start to come to 2014. You know, the Rosie Hackett Bridge, part of the Lewis project, and you know, and then the Lewis LCC works com commence. You know, so you know, back in the back in the early late 90s, you know. We were planning for, uh, you know, the Port Tunnel, Samuel Becker Bridge, the James Joyce Bridge, you know, introduction of Lewis, and then we were starting to plan for Dart Underground um, Metro, you know, huge, huge ambitious plans. Um, and of the three, the Dart Underground, the Metro, and the Lewis, the Lewis is the one that has commenced. So, you know, it's not unexpected that, uh, you know, there was a bit of a hiatus, to, to be quite blunt about it, and in the amount of money and the amount of projects that were being delivered. Having said that, you know, the point I, was, point I was making was that we can't actually fit the same number of vehicles anymore into the city as we used to back in 2006. So our goal is not to get back to 2006 levels. Our goal is to make sure that we don't get back anywhere near that in terms of, of vehicles in the city centre. This is, I know I said I'm not very fond of mode splits, but I'll show you two anyway, just to um, just to illustrate some points. This is the most fit for people working in the city centre from the census data. Um, so as we can see, you know, car 26, bus 26, rail, you know, they're all pretty much much even. So between the different modes, it's fair, fairly even how people get in. If you look at, um, if you look at, sorry, it shouldn't say people working, it should say people living in the city centre. It's a completely different matter, as you'd kind of expect for cars, only really 9%. And it's kind of interesting how people take this as different different ways when they see this one, actually. I showed it to Owen Keegan, our chief executive, and Owen says to me, well, if only 9% of people are using cars, why are we bothering conditioning car apartments in the city centre for car parks? You know, why do we need to make, a, make use of the space if they're not making use of cars? So I told him maybe people use them for leisure or at the weekends or whatever, but uh, it is one way, of, one way of looking at it. So clearly the, you know, as the population of city centre grows, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, expected to get to about 190,000. You do have that difference between the people who are coming in by one mode and the people who are living in the city who are using what are really essentially quite different modes to get around. And this just looks at employment location, so we can clearly see the south, southeast of the city, city centre is the, is the key. It's just a heat map of where, where people are working. Um, and then we look at the quadrants. So as far as we're concerned, the, the, there is the city centre quadrant, which really is this um, four square kilometre area where you've got the major retail, major employment, and now you've increasingly got major residential areas. And then we come to this, which is a nice photograph um, of Lower Grafton Street closed completely, which is um, when they were taking up the rails. And it's an interesting one because one, they're taking up the rails that obviously we're going to put back down again. And right in the background is what replaced it, you know, which was the, uh, the bus. So you went from, you know, quite a, quite a 
a crowded kind of street here to you know to where they took it up and we're now as i say addressing this particular problem again and this is really what uh, the nice visualizations of of lewis coming down dawson street and the dawson street stop um show you and i suppose you know, one of the things about Lewis Cross City uh, is it is the big important project. It will provide quite a lot of additional connectivity in the city. It's obviously doing Grange Gorman, but it will connect the retail centres together. It will connect, you know, Grafton Street to, to O'Connell Street, but it will also connect the different car parks and different sides of the, of, of the city. Um, but it's also quite an important urban regeneration scheme. So as it comes down from uh, from uh, Stevens Green all the way through here, you know, places being regenerated, the road surface has changed, the footpaths have been done, and you know, it, it will provide at the end of the day quite a good streetscape to, to go through. Um, I suppose the other thing to, to bear in mind of that, particularly say in places like Dawson Street, this is a two track, so as they construct, they, they do it in four stripes, so they take a uh, space for the track, they, they build the track in, in sections. So they take one, then they take the other, then they take the footpath, put the pedestrians out in the road, then they take the other footpath. So you go in four times into this with, with diversions and with, um, uh, with, with traffic restrictions and it takes them really about three months per, per section. So this shows you the Lewis, uh, Lewis Red Line and Lewis Cross City. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of things to bear in mind with Lewis, which is different from the ones that we've done before. And the first thing is, you know, we've got over 30 trams an hour at the moment on the red line. So there's a tram every minute, er, sorry, every two minutes passing through O'Connell Street. And now we'll actually have tram versus tram. So we'll have tram coming this way and we'll have tram going that way. Um, that in itself will be an interesting, uh, an interesting one and put quite a, quite a restriction on what happens in that area. So you'll have really, at each of those uh, intersections, you'll have 45 trams an hour, okay? The other thing to bear in mind is this defines how many trams operate from either the red line or the green line, you know? So you've got the point of congestion of the tram network in O'Connell Street and in Abbey Street. And that's why, as, as the RPA are, are, are looking to the future, what, what they want to do is to, is to really tunnel from Broombridge and come up in Stevens Green to actually get around some of this bottleneck which is going to be imposed here. Um, we also have what we don't have at the moment, which is long sections of non-segregated running. Okay? So if you think about the tram system at the moment, mostly, I think it's probably 97% or maybe 98%, is segregated running. It might be on the street, it might look nice and pretty, but you don't drive in it. Okay, so there's only a few sections that come to mind. Small section down at Beresford Place that comes to mind, and a little bit of Abbey Street uh, at Jarvis Street, but mostly it's completely segregated. Now it's not segregated, so you're driving on the tram uh, where the tram alignment is. So as you come down through College Green, as you go across uh, O'Connell Bridge, as you head towards uh, O'Connell Street, it's large sections of it are unsegregated. And I don't know whether any of you have ever seen what unsegregated tramways look like, um, but I was in Sheffield and I've never actually seen a traffic jam with four trams sitting in it before. So that's what unsegregated uh, looks like if you don't manage it correctly. And this is obviously the, the real thing, how, how to avoid, as well as dealing with these, con well not conflict points, but just tram versus tram, but how do you actually make, how do you actually keep things going? Um, and you know, this is the receiving environment, you know, that we have at the moment. So this is West Morning Street. And, you know, if you're not familiar with it, but basically the inner lane here is really your where your tram line is. Okay? So as you come through here, that's what that's what the where the tram line is going. And it's coming across here and heading for the outer lane going up O'Connell Street. That's all shared running. You know, it's not segregated, so it's all shared running. So so that's a a pretty significant challenge. As it comes past the spar, then it comes into the it comes into the medium, and when it gets to where that bus is, it suddenly becomes an even bigger challenge because it goes into what they call a delta. The tram can either go this way or it can go this way. Um, you've got all kinds of issues just at that point. Then 
you know, to, to, to manage both traffic and the tram, and even in this area to manage pedestrians, because the tram is at medium grade, at medium level, and then has to get down to road level as it's going in the delta. So significant challenges there. And then in order to make it work as part of the railway order, there are a number of uh, permanent traffic changes which, which have to come into place. So first one at the bottom of uh, Dawson Street, there's no right turn to Nassau Street. So, um, you know, it's going to be built out, or at the moment, that's what the railway order says. So you won't be able to drive down Dawson Street anymore. That's the simple truth of the matter. You have no right turn to Delir Street. Uh, O'Connell Bridge, only public transport, only buses will be allowed to turn right off O'Connell of Bridge onto Eden Key. And no right turn to Calabria Street either. So because the track is going to be go along on the median, is the median where you, or sorry, the road where you turn into Calabria Street at the moment will be closed up. Um, so the good news about that is that while people think uh, Lewis Cross City will be in operation at the end of 2017, and this is a little bit away from everybody to worry about, um, some of these changes will go in, not probably this year, but certainly probably next year. And the reason for it is that as you build the track, you put the changes in, you put the permanent elements of this in. And remember what I said, the track this time is, is, is not segregated. So before this, when, when Lewis came in, when the, say the red line in, in Pitigar was built, uh, once people were in and they'd taken the space, it got, it, it, the next use of it was when the tram came in. In this particular case, as they go along, they're going to build the various different permanent elements of the works in, in sections and, and stages. And when they finish that, uh, the permanent changes come in. So you're going to have a period of time when you're going to have permanent changes like this, and you won't have a tram running. So you get all the pain and none of the gain, which is a, one of the worst uh, times of it. Um, and I suppose it's occurred to most people looking at this, or maybe it's not, but it's occurred to most people. If you're driving down Dame Street and you're heading anywhere that way, you know, you now are driving up O'Connell Street, you know, coming through a segregated Lewis section or a non-segregated Lewis section, crossing over the Lewis to go around Parnell Square and then trying to head over that way to get anywhere there. So it probably doesn't take a genius to work out we're not going to probably let you do that because there is no point. So. That's going to be one of the, the, the major changes with it. Um, if you then um, look at it in the context of the BRTs, and you know, one of the things about the BRTs is you know, we're just showing some lines here. The, 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 the full routes aren't chosen, but you know, this is basically what they're going to look like. So you're going to have uh, um, BRTs, LRTs, the bus network, and you're going to have the Liffey cycle route, which is, which is in brown here as well. So you've got some considerable amount of, of activity, particularly just in this area. So, you know, if you take going down to Tower Street, you've got the Dart. You're going to have the Lewis in Hawkins Street um, and in Westmoreland Street. Um, BRT is coming through as well, both Geordie Street and O'Connell Street. Um, you're going to have the normal conventional bus network as well in this area. Uh, and you're obviously going to have the cycling, walking, deliveries requirements as well. So it's a, it's a difficult prospect. So going back into our vaults of great photographs of Dublin again, um, this is one from College Green in 1946. So buses, cars, <coughs> trams. So this is, you know, just before trams were really taken out of it. And obviously cyclists here as well. Um, so it's an interesting uh, question to, to think whether we're going to do that. Or we're going to do something quite radical. It mightn't be quite like this, but at the moment we are probably going to do something pretty radical in College Green because we're not going to be able to cope with it any other way. Um, so it's it's a it's a difficult uh, task or a difficult proposition. So if you look at what what's I suppose going to happen over the next while, so we got Lewis Cross City 2017, and as I said, some of the changes coming in in much earlier than that. We've got probably the first of the bus rapid transit networks coming into service in 2020. And we've got our cycle network, which things like the Liffey cycle route and so on, hopefully by about 2018. Um, so it isn't, um, what would you say, it's pretty clear 
that once again we're, we're back into radical changes in the city centre after a period of relative, well maybe relative calm or whatever, I'm not sure. Um, once again I'm proved wrong about percentages, I did use some percentages here, but uh, so the car to 20%, so um, 20% by the way is what the development plan, our development plan calls for us to be by 2017 and at the moment we're at 33%. So. And if you remember back to our figures for our vehicles, we managed to reduce it by about five and a half thousand vehicles over the last nine years, I think. Um, what we're looking at here is something like 15,000 okay, in the morning peak to reduce it. Um, and obviously that has to be done through public transport, walking and cycling. Um, so I suppose one of, the, one of the focuses between ourselves and the NTA has been to, to look at the city centre study, to look at how, how we approach that. And it is quite quite focused on the city centre for a number of reasons. Obviously, um, you know, it is the main hub, it is the place where, where uh, you know, all, a lot of things are happening. Also, we have the NTA will be coming out in June with their uh, GDA investment strategy, so it kind of complements this. We're actually, be, we'll be out uh, next month with our city centre uh, study looking at some of the options and looking at a whole suite of measures. But for example, you know, some of the things that are going to happen, you know, Phoenix Park Tunnel, um, so Irish Rail are now committed to running trains through to Connolly Station. Um, the DART is going to go to a 10 minute frequency, so that effectively gives us an extra 30% on the DART network. We're looking at three public transport interchanges. Two of them are kind of fairly obvious to most people. The third one we'll need to talk about. One of them obviously is Connolly, one of them is, is Houston Station. And when we say we're talking about the interchanges like at Connolly, we're, 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 I suppose, looking to see whether the Lewis should be removed out of Connolly and whether that space should be better used and whether there should be um, a linked platform across, say, to Bussaris. Uh, but basically, how do you move between Connolly, Bussaris? Um, and how do you interchange between Lewis, Dart and so on, taking into account then the Dart on the ground may come along at some stage. We have a commitment between ourselves and the NTA to go back to all the QBCs. So all the radio QBCs will be gone back to once again uh, with the intention of increasing their speed and making some use of some of the data that we, we now have. And if I have time, I'll show you some of that. We obviously have the BRT with the cycling network and we've the whole issue of walking and public realm improvement. In terms of managed deliveries, uh, at the moment we have a five axle band throughout the, the city centre, but what we're also looking at is, and it's not just ourselves, but there's actually a bit of pressure from several, uh, from a lot of the companies within the city centre, particularly say around Grafton Street, which has been redeveloped, and as we move, extend the Grafton Street scheme out to the other uh, streets around it, there is a, a real uh, desire for the City Council to put in place a more managed deliveries uh, structure. So that's something we're going to be, we're going to be looking at. Our, our city development plan calls for us to, to, to do this. And I think one of the aspects when we look back at, at what happened with the recession is it kind of stalled a lot of things. It was like, you know, as long as we were still there and as long as we still had a job and as long as there was still movement in the city, people were quite, quite happy. But this is what we were really called upon to do was to restrict true traffic and calm traffic generally. And while we've done some of that, I don't think we've, we've done anywhere near enough of it yet. Um, again from the vault, I presume most of you can recognise where this is. Any guesses? Grafton Street, yeah. Um, they tried pedestrianisation of Grafton. I didn't realise this until I read the 1971 report. They actually tried it in something like 1969, 1970 and it was thrown out. So it's quite startling, you know, that uh, the idea of taking buses and so on down in this area. This one I like because this, this is the future with the, the, with the one cyclist uh, heading down Grafton Street. But I, I just, you know, it's great, it's great to look back at it, but the idea of having a skip in the middle of Grafton Street and, you know, um, and having pedestrian lights across Grafton Street. So it's just, it's just quite incredible. This bigger one, um, it's just a, a, an interesting one because it kind of, um, first of all, it shows you Stevens Green before the Lewis, so it was always useful for people to remember what it was like. Um, and I don't know whether any of you remember, but uh, at Christmas, because people were going, you know, the traffic divided in two ways, the guards had to get out and man this to stop it actually grinding to a halt. So you had four lanes of traffic, lane of parking, 
uh, and a lane of illegal cars parking as well. So, you know, it was quite visionary to say, well, let's take out two of these lanes and the lane of parking and put a Lewis in. Um, and that's what it looks like now. However, one of the things about this is, uh, which people perhaps forget, uh, is that when Lewis opened, we actually kept the two lanes going by Lewis for a period of time. Okay, so Lewis opened in, two, in June 2004. We didn't close this till September 2004. Okay? And I'd like to say, because I, I did it, but I'd like to say that I did it because I had a really great idea how to do this. I didn't, I, we closed it because our road construction division, because the utilities contractor had made such a mess of the road when he put the utilities in, it was in danger of collapse. And they said, we have to close the green for a period of time. And so that's when we came up with the notion of, of diverting it. But prior to that, and for the duration of when they took the two lanes, and then when Lewis was in operation, this was what the other side, coming round by the Department of Foreign Affairs, this is, as you can see, 21st of the 4th, 2004, when they had taken the two lanes for Lewis. Lewis wasn't, was just doing <coughs> testing at that stage, it wasn't open. Complete line of Dublin bus buses in two lanes from junction with uh, Harcourt Street all the way back to Leeson Street. It was taking Dublin bus something like 60 minutes to get around here. Okay? So we obviously changed that, and that's, that's not, but, you know, that's not uh, what, what happens now. And obviously we've gone back in again to the green and done more changes where we've diverted people at, at uh, Bergen Row. But that was the impact of it in the first time. So as I say, I'd like to say that we had this great idea for how to, how to divert the traffic and manage the traffic. Uh, but it was not coincidence, but it was, it was forced on us. So, you know, having learned, that ex having learned that experience, I suppose, when we were looking at Lewis this time, that's why we put in place Marion Row prior to Lewis going into Dawson Street. That's why we, we put in Kildare Street two-way again to, to facilitate Dawson Street works. Because if you try and imagine what Dawson Street, which used to have two, three lanes of traffic and down, it would be like restricted to one lane, you know, unless we did that, um, you know, it, it would be pretty horrendous. And this is what we hope to end up at the top of uh, Grafton Street, um, continuing the pedestrianisation of Grafton Street up to Stevens Green. So allowing for the delivery, same delivery times up to 11 o'clock, but after that being pedestrianised area from Dawson Street to Global Valley. So that will be coming out as a, as a part eight uh, proposal uh, for, from ourselves. So it, it makes good use of that particular space and should be a pretty good, um, should be a pretty good uh, initiative. I was talking about public transport where we said there was this uh, reduction in public transport, but we would regard it as being capacity in public transport. So we would say that you know there's 10,000 capacity in public transport that just needs to be brought back in again. The bus rapid transit is one way of doing it, and some of you are probably quite familiar with the idea of you know this. So there's three proposed routes, um, and the one that will get done first is the is the Swords one because there's parts of it being worked on at the moment. Uh, but the Swords one hopefully operational by 2020. Enormous difficulties putting BRT through the city centre, uh, to be honest, but. This is the, you know, this is the rationale, this is the catchment area. It's, it's um, trying to have the same level of service as an LRT. Again, uh, it, it's, not say, it's not fully segregated because, um, you know, we're not going to have curbs, we're not going to have, uh, there is going to be other vehicles in, in it. So it's going to be quite a difficult one. But it does offer us both, both a loose um, and BRT offers us quite a, quite a unique opportunity to modify some of the roads in the city centre. So this is the Lear Street at the moment, really three rolling lanes, two parking lanes. Um, and this is one uh, concept for it where we basically reduce that quite considerably. Um, the inner one here is for your Swift Drive, for your BRT, and the outside one is for your, is for your bus and taxi car access around it. Okay? And if you remember back, I said, you know, we're talking about three, three main interchanges. This is, this is one of the interchanges, because if you think about Delir Street and Westmoreland Street and Hawkins Street, you've got bus, you've got tram, uh, you've got BRT, 
and you're quite close to Tara Street for Dart. So it's quite a big uh, potential interchange in, in, in that space. And while this visualization of Westmoreland Street is not necessarily what we're going to do, but it gives you, again, some of the illustrations. So Westmoreland Street, uh, again, with its, with its footpaths extended, so we, we want to try and um, bring across the extension of the footpaths that we did in O'Connell Street. Um, in, into this area, which will necessitate things like closures of Fleet Street and so on. We intend to remove the, from Westmoreland Street, we intend to remove the left turn into, into Aston's Quay, which will give us much more space and much more pedestrian flow through that area. Um, but again, if you, if you think about the Lewis being on Westmoreland Street, the BRT being in Delir Street, you know, bus network in between, walking, a lot of people being delivered into this particular area. Um, you know, it makes for quite a quite a reasonable or a, quite a good interchange. And I suppose again, you know, uh, without going into any great details of what we're going to do, but it's pretty obvious, I think, if you look at some of these things, that the one thing we're not going to do is a lot of let, let a lot of general traffic into this area. So restrictions on the amount of traffic on the on the north and south views. Um, is going to be one of the features of what, what we'll be looking at. And I think if you go back to, to what the, <clears throat> the picture I was showing of, of O'Connell Street, you know, when we reduced it down from roughly about 1,400 down to about 200 cars, we, di we did a number of interventions which, you know, all linked into that and all happened before that. So the intervention, like you can't turn right at the bottom of um, Georgia Street, you can't turn left at the bottom of Dawson Street, you can't go through from Pier Street into College Street. Um, and then the really big one, um, which was South or North, North Frederick Street, where we reversed North Frederick Street and put a country road bus line into it. At one stroke, we cut off the way of getting into O'Connell Street. And that's really where that, that allowed us to do a number of things. It allowed us to do the O'Connell Street scheme and also allowed Lewis to be built, you know, to be quite frank, the first red line, you know, because they needed the space to put the, the ESB substation in. And they also needed the to get their tracks across. So that was a, that was a real killer. That was 2002, um, and that was a really, really important intervention at that stage. Just talk a little bit about, I suppose, QBC analysis, um, because you know, I was saying that you know we, we we want to really emphasize public transport. And one of the one of the things that's coming true with some of the say some of the analysis of, of this. Uh, of the QBCs at the moment, so this is bang up to date information, is that some of them are actually performing rather poorly. So you've got Ballymun, uh, Route 4 in, which is, this is 9 kilometres, averaging 9 kilometres. The target is about 20 kilometres. Um, so again, it's, it's, we want to go back and we, we're, we're starting a process. We've, we've put together a team to look at um, you know, bus priority, AVL reports, you know, the data that we're getting from, from Dublin Bus. Um, and now with the amount of data we get from Dublin bus, um, because we, we have a uh, real-time connection to all the bus fleet, uh, we, can sit, we can actually identify each and every location that we have a segment of roadway that isn't performing optimally. So for example, this, this particular one here, each of the red dots uh, represents a, 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 um, a GPS trace from a bus. So GPS, the, the bus itself reports its location to ourselves every 20 seconds. So every 20 seconds, uh, we get uh, an update from the entire Dublin bus fleet uh, of where they are. So if you look here, it, you know, as the dots get closer, this is bus in congestion. Okay, so we can do this for every single route, every single bus, every single location in the city. And then we can work out what the intervention is. The intervention in this particular case, you can see the after effect of the intervention. The intervention in this particular case was at the traffic signal, so uh, we, we put in some, some priority via the SCAT system for it. But because we have this, we, we can use it for both traffic signals, we can use it for civil intervention. And as we think about going forward for, say, the BRT uh, routes, one of, the, one of the aspects that we're going back on is we're looking at the design of QBCs and how they're performing. And remember, as I said, we, we, we now have this so much data from, from the AVL system, the Automatic Vehicle Location System, which we didn't have when we did some of these. So this is a fairly straightforward one. This is the, um, 
the Malahide N32 uh, junction. So a bus comes down this way and comes in to turn left. Okay? And this was not actually done all that long ago. It was done, QBN office did it a couple of years ago, which was the Malahide um, kind of upgrade or, you know, looking at from the QBC, get, put, um, you know, to, to go back in and re retrofit some of the, uh, some new facilities in it. So, you know, on paper it looked, it looked fine. Um, but the data that we, we get uh, tells us exactly where the bus has a problem. So in this particular case, just to explain it, we've Clare Hall Avenue Malhide Road, we've got a stop number, which um, is just below us there. And then it tells us of the number of trips that go through here, how many of them stop, how many of them get delayed. So the average stop time is 59 seconds. So this is when we say stop time, by the way, what we, it's what they call unscheduled stops. In other words, it's not at a bus stop. It's either stuck in traffic, it's stuck at traffic lights, but it's not at a bus stop. So the average so you got 83, out of the 86 trips, 83% of them get stuck for a minute at this location. Okay, so, you know, making use of the data then, and making use of our CCTV system, you can see what the problem is. The problem is that when it was designed, it looked fine, it looked fine when it went in. But what's actually happening is, there's a short lane, short straight ahead lane here, which is blocking the left turn lane. Right, so 86, 86 buses delayed a minute because of that kind of design. Um, and a fairly straightforward intervention, get rid of one of the lanes, take back the hatching. And it was kind of interesting, we did all that, and all the taxis sat in the hatched area and still tried to go across the road, which they were no longer lined up to do. So we then had to put in a whole series of, um, we had to put in a whole series of bollards instead. Um, but that's the net effect of it, that the straight ahead traffic no longer blocks it. Um, just to turn to cycling, just I think I'll pr pretty much finish in cycling because I was asked to keep it relatively short. Um, I suppose one of the things is looking at the current cycling projects, which again are a key important aspect of what we're trying to do. So these are really the canalways, the Liffey cycle route, the S2S, um, then coming in on the swords, and we've also got the daughter. But I suppose most people know the canalway, and um, you know the canalway is hugely, uh, hugely used now. It's about four thousand cyclists uh, per day, and that really equates to about a million trips. And to put it in context, the Greenway in in um, Westport gets a hundred thousand trips. So it's a really good facility. And we finished it in 2011. Uh, we had a long delay till we got the actual statutory instruments from the department to actually open it. So that's why we finished it about six months before it opened. And we opened in 2012, 3.6 kilometers of a 16.7 kilometer route. And we haven't added a single solitary meter to Canalway since because we haven't had the funding. Um, so that's been a real disappointment for us. The good, uh, good news is though we finally managed to get some funding to complete this. So we'll be doing phase two and three, and we'll be doing, which will take us up to, to um, Fulthborough, um, and we'll also be doing the widening of Newcomen Bridge. So um, they're particularly good ones to go with. Um, the canalway uh, and the way of doing it was, was really to have this premium off segregated route, um, you know, high quality. And in fairness to, to the guys who worked on it, like Chris Manzira and Don Madden and Conor Leary is here as well, um, there was some really, really significant stuff that had to be done in this, particularly at the canal, where they had to be cantilevered out to provide the actual amount of space. And this looks at some of the traffic. So red is one direction. Red is actually coming up, the, if you like, towards Easton Street. Green is going down. And you can see how much of this is a commuter route now. Right? So... This is a time period six to eleven, you know. So um, you can clearly see the way it's it's quite peaked. Uh, it's 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 people really using it for commuting, and it's quite interesting as well that people don't really use this for leisure, because um, this is a work day. This is Friday. That's Saturday. So we thought it was we started out in more of a leisure route, and it's turned into more of a um, I suppose a commuting route. And then you know we have the Liffey uh, 
cycle route, which uh, has been out to public consultation and uh, which we're going to bring a report to the SPC on shortly. But this is where uh, the traffic department back, I don't know how many people ever read our, our city centre strategy of 2008, but we first of all, on that and sketched out how we were going to do this. Um, this is really what we're looking at doing now. But I suppose there was a number of elements to it, even before we were thinking of a cycle track, we were thinking of this idea. The problem with the North Keys, and there's about three different problems as, as we would see it. First of all, this is the gateway to the city, which looks like a three-lane highway. In fact, it is a three-lane highway. This has also got a high-speed location. It's, you know, people think of it congested in the morning. Most of the time, this is not congested. This key and the opposite key are two of the highest, highest speeding locations in the city. Um, so this is the intention, right, to completely transform that. So as you're coming into Dublin, you're now behind this, you're no longer faced with this big roadway into the city centre. And you've also done something which really isn't, isn't available. You've, you've really brought um, the Phoenix Park, the green of the Phoenix Park, that wit bit nearer to the city centre. Um, and you've also provided a really good uh, off-road cycle route, hopefully, through it. Um, and this is what the proposal is. Uh, you know, take the road coming across here and bring it to the back of the Coppies Acre. And then take the buses down beside the Lewis, and then the car, remaining car traffic come back onto the Keys, so that the lane on the Keys, the two lanes on the Keys, one of them will be for cars, the other lane is given over to a segregated two-way cycle track. Um, so pretty ambitious project, and it's not shown here, but we're, we're also going to get some, hopefully some land off Guinnesses to actually soften this whole junction here and actually put some green space on the other side of it as well. And I suppose this is a, a real example of, uh, of a multifunction uh, project because uh, the other thing that the Keys do is they flood, and they flood pretty badly. Okay? So in 2014, we had seven of the 10 highest tides on record in Dublin. And when we get a really high tide, we lose the north and south keys of these key locations. So we either have to build up the road or you know, hopefully do the other scheme, which is, if you like, allow the cycling cyclists to be flooded, but not the cars, but you, know, you can take care of that. But Obviously, this, this poor individual here was uh, trying, to, trying to make his way through it. But you can see, you can actually see how high the river is at that particular point. So this scheme, as I say, does a number of different things. It tries to, it tries to soften the way people take the, the North Keys. It reduces the speeding location. And it removes the flooding uh, risk from it, uh, as well as providing really good, high-quality cycle route. And I suppose when we think of it, as I was saying, you know, we do have to restrict traffic on the North and South Keys because the North and South Keys, when you look at the city, is really the anomaly in the city at this stage. They're the, as somebody called it, the water divided dual carriageway through the city centre. And we removed a lot of the other routes through the city centre. Um, so this is really going to be our next challenge. So I'm going to finish up with this particular watery picture and, and hope that uh, people found it interesting. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Brendan. That's, that's a fantastic uh, chronology there of Dublin's uh, transport uh, challenges. Um, we'll just throw it open to the floor, maybe, if there's any questions that anybody would like to ask Brendan. Maybe I might lead the charge myself. Um, I'm just aware from back in the day of attending some seminars and whatnot on, uh, I think, Booz, Alan Hamilton were asked to look many years ago, probably over 10 years ago, at a cordon survey study of, you know, uh, uh, I came to the London congestion charge uh, system. I know that was discussed many years ago in the context of Dublin. I didn't notice that as a component of the presentation today. Is that something that's uh, been discarded for now, or maybe that might be revisited when the infrastructural initiatives that you mentioned there have been delivered or are more mature? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not part of our planning at the moment, no. Uh, I suppose there's a number of reasons for it. One is, um, you know, the city centre itself, uh, it's a pretty high mode 
share on uh, sustainable maintenance critical infrastructure. Uh, we do want to reduce the number of cars in the previous city centre we don't need to, and we also want to move people onto city transport. We also recognise the fact that commercial activity, uh, leisure activity, retail activity can go down in city centre and the tax cuts and things can happen. So from a city orientated point of view, the congestion cars coming into the city centre uh, would just be a simple recipe for, for uh, every location to really pick up uh, business from the city. What we would be more in favour of is just more of a distance of Uh, he does tend to get his way. All right. Uh, any other questions to the floor? Second there. Just a quick comment. You showed some drawings there from the Secretary Labour Report, 1970. Yep. And the attempt at that time to pedestrianise Grafton Street. Now, just make the comment. The reason the pedestrianisation was stopped was because of objections from the engineers in Dublin Corporation. And the inner tangent ring was also proposals by the engineers in Dublin Corporation. And if it hadn't been for Frank McDonald's book, The Destruction of Dublin, they could well have happened. I, 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 quite, I quite agree with you. And I think there's a, there's a useful comment from uh, Tim Brick, uh, who said that uh, you know in the 70s, we had all the plans, but no money. And by the time we got some money in the 80s and 90s, nobody wanted to do those plans anymore. So we were... I, th I think, you know, being honest about it, I think Dublin was saved, really, from those plans. I think it would be a, a completely different place, and we'd be looking at a completely different set of problems. I mean, it is a challenge to keep on growing the city and keep on moving and moving forward and so on. And, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, having limited road space and then trying to, to change the use of that road space is a big challenge, and we've tried to do that over the years with sometimes success and sometimes not, but uh, I'd much prefer to be looking at those kind of problems than necessarily a motorway bridge in front of the forecourts. So. What do you think about the use of the traffic? Especially in London, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and especially in light of um, the, the railway that we're building straight through the middle of the city. Well, I mean, I suppose, you know, it's, it, the point is that there's an east-west access to the city centre, which, which has remained pretty relatively unchanged over the years, whereas we've, we've dramatically changed the north-south axis. Um, you know, if you think of the bridges that have been built, you know, the James Joyce to the west, the Samuel Beckett to, to the east, you know, both of those were designed for orbital movements, was to take some, you know, to take that north-south across the Connell Bridge out of the equation. Um, and, you know, when you look at it, when you think of it, uh, you know, the majority of traffic at O'Connell Bridge is, is derived from the north and south queues. In context of the railway, uh, as, you, as you call it, or uh, a light rail, I suppose, maybe, um, that we're building or is being built, the conflict between the number of vehicles we have on the North Keys and the tram is, is, uh, is substantial. And I think we need to bear something else in mind, you know, if you look at the North Keys, it's where everybody, not aimlessly, but everybody goes to the North Keys if they're coming in from the west. And some people are coming, they're coming in, they're going over the river twice. So they're going over the river, going on to the North Keys, then going over the river, coming back and heading maybe towards the southeast. But what brings a huge amount of congestion into the city centre is, is certain types of concerts on at the point, at the, at the O2 or 3 Arena, whatever they call it. Um, because as people try and move through there, particularly in the evening peak, they just can't. And you get a lot of, lot, a lot of congestion caused by that. So what we want to do is we want to look at how we can get those people who want to do that in by different routes. And for example, you know, I, you know, I didn't get to touch on all the aspects of what we were planning, but say, for example, one of the aspects is the port tunnel. You know, how do we use the port tunnel more effectively? Uh, the East Link Toll Bridge is coming back to the City Council ownership from the end of this year. And we want to look at how, uh, we're already talking in an array about how we might do combined, some sort of combined tolling. So if you come in through the port tunnel and come across the East Link, um, you get a reduced rate. You know, we also want to look at how, you know, if you come in through the port tunnel, you know, is there, is there scope for 
uh, some parking facilities? Is there scope to, to have a reduced Lewis fare into the city centre? So, you know, being able to drive trait along the east west, the west east axis or east west axis is, is, is a problem in the city centre, and it's one over the next number of years is going to be addressed. I suppose what we should say, in fairness to most people, is that the Lewis works may force us to do something about it far quicker than we'd even thought we were going to do something about it. Any other questions then? So say say the right turns, um, or the kind of sorry. What 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 I said about those was that they will go in. They have to go in for as part of the railway order. So they'll go in as part of the they're part of the permanent works. They're part of the permanent traffic changes. What what I was saying was that. The only uncertainty about them is exactly when we need to put them in. But uh, no matter what happens by 2017, they're in. There's no uncertainty about, uh, necessarily about them. Yeah, okay. And then you said there were some decisions still to be made about pedestrianisation as well. Um, yes, well, I mean, College Green uh, in particular, um, you know, is the, is the big one that we're trying to, that we're looking at at the moment. Um, and I suppose we're looking at it from the point of view of trying to figure out how, how to get trams through there, try and figure out how to get buses through there, try to figure out how to get cyclists, pedestrians, how to improve the pedestrian environment. And really, you can't fit everything there. There is also a desire and, and a really a stated objective to try and create more of a civic space at that location. Um, so one of the things we're looking at is can we actually bring it down to one lane in each direction? Uh, does that, what, what does that mean that we have to limit? So for example, general traffic we have to limit um, or remove, uh, but perhaps we have to take taxis out of there as well. So there's a, quite a few issues that we have to decide on. I suppose when, with, with the Lewis project, the, the location of the rails, uh, you know, where, where they are is more or less fixed. We're doing a little bit of um, adjustment with that. But the rest of the space in College Green then is up for, if you like, grabs to decide what way to do it. Um, and we have to bear in mind, I mean, it's the big, it, it is the big uh, transport bottleneck in the, in the city in a way, because there's nothing we can do between Bank of Ireland and Trinity College. So eventually, and I didn't get to touch on it in this, but eventually once, you know, in the longer term, we do have to look at the underground options again, the Dart Underground, um, maybe perhaps not the Metro, but, it, but again an LRT Underground uh, to remove some of the problems with the trams crossing each other. You know, in the longer term, that, that's really what needs to be worked at. And I suppose one of the concerns we would have is that uh, having gone through a lot of big infrastructural projects, those particular projects that should be really starting to be progressed are, are not being progressed. Uh, lack of funding, so on. But we are going to have, we are probably going to have a, a, a lag. So we'll have a lag between being able to provide the transportation that's needed and the, de and the demand coming back. And that's really what we're most concerned about. Thanks. Um, I might wrap it up then. Actually, if you can call upon uh, uh, our civil division liaison, Peter Monaghan, to just give the, the, the vote of thanks, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donald. And uh, Brendan, uh, I wanted to com commend you on an excellent and informative talk and question and answer session afterwards. Um, I enjoyed the journey from the past uh, to now to the, the challenges that you see and the thoughts on, on how they might be uh, addressed. Um, and I also like the way you contextualize how the challenges have changed over the years and how the solutions to those challenges, or at least the perceived solutions, have changed. Um, I mean, you're, to quote you, I think you said, uh, we want to reduce the number of cars that currently travel through the city centre, which is in juxtaposition with, or juxtaposed with the, uh, the 1971 plan, um, which, which, which you put up on, on screen for us, um, and where the solutions now are primarily public transport, walking, cycling, and, and not private transport. Um, so I'd like to call upon everybody here to show their uh, gratitude in the traditional way for such a wonderful talk. Thank you.